Good day everyone, Doc Mika here, and we will be discussing the cytologic effects of viral infections. During the lecture of viral replication, we have uh, discussed on how the virus hijacks the machinery and how it um, influences the cell and the different compartments of the cell to use it for the replication process. Now, let's see how um, these uh, virus cell interactions happen and how it affects each cell and the specific parts of the cell, that is. All right, let's begin. The virus cell interaction would have multiple effects on a cell, but primarily it causes inflammatory or physiological responses which facilitate shedding. For example, uh, sneezing and coughing, right? That actually helps in shedding the virus in record amounts into the environment for it to find another susceptible host. Number two, another physiological response because of this virus cell interaction, diarrhea. Diarrhea enhances the environmental contamination with the progeny virus. Number three, um, uh, immunosuppression, virus-induced immunosuppression. Um, it facilitates the restriction of host immune responses to benefit the viral spread. It also predisposes the host to develop or to contract secondary microbial infections. So whatever the interaction is, it can cause ultimately these physiological responses, which benefits the virus and not the host itself. So what are these interactions? They can be cytopathic, wherein there is inhibition of 100% of the cellular protein DNA and RNA synthesis to promote viral replication, which ultimately leads to cell death. Um, you can also have a non-cytopathic interaction wherein there is no cell death, but can lead to a persistent productive or persistent non-productive interaction. We will discuss this later. And it can also lead to the transformation of the cell wherein the viruses will not replicate, but instead, they will cause alteration in the cell morphology and function, right? To summarize all that, right? So, again, the goal of any uh, virus would be to um, facilitate infection, spread, and shedding, but it must be balanced with minimal adverse effect on the host, all right? Hindi niya pwedeng um, gamitin lang lahat ng cells and kill them to produce all variants because they can produce more if somehow the, uh, the cell continues to live, all right? So let's discuss for cytocidal or cytopathic, all right? In the cytopathic cell, uh, virus cell interaction, there is loss of the cell function, which are essential for the cell survival. Kumbaga, 100% of the resources of the animal are fo um, sorry, resources of the cell are now focused on viral resources instead of cellular resources to produce progeny virus, right? So this is an example of that. This is a time-lapse video of uh, culture cells infected with Zika virus. The one on the right would be um, the cells infected with Zika virus.
the time would be in the middle. Right? These cells are continually dividing. For nine, uh, non-cytopathic infections can be clinically significant when they disrupt uh, cell specialized functions. Right? Usually, since you are not um, killing the cell, right? a part of the cell maintains the functions. Right? Uh, it commonly leads to persistent infection. So what we call persistent productive. There is production of progeny virus there. And there could be a possible loss of specialized functions if the virus infects specialized cells. Right? Examples of these are arena viruses, rabies, uh, most retroviruses. What do I mean? Okay. Usually, since uh, kapag non-cytopathic yung, yung interaction ng virus sa cell, wala kang makikita ng clinical sign. Okay? Unless, unless the virus infects a specialized cell with a specialized function that can be seen outside, you know, um, manifested by the body. For example, um, if the neurons are non-cytopathically non infected by variants, Okay, they can lose uh, impulse conduction. Pwedeng bumaba, uh, pwedeng maapektohan yung mga myelin sheath, and therefore the conduction of nerve impulses would be impaired if not stopped. Uh, for um, if viruses would infect oligodendrocytes, right? Again, loss of myelin formation that could be a clinical neurological disease. So this relationship may uh, give rise to a persistent infection since the cell is surviving um, and since the cell is uh, is the home of this virus the immune mechanisms mounted by the body cannot eliminate the virus because it is not programmed to uh, kill a living cell unless the cell gives a signal to these uh, immune mechanisms to kill it right and there is a low level of virus replications, uh, sorry, virus replication, which assures the persistence of the virus genetic information. Because you are not using up that viral RNA and they are staying there within that cell, then it is persistent, right? So, uh, sorry, uh, before I go to non-productive, this is also... Um, the way for some uh, viruses to remain inside a body, not cause any infection, not cause any, uh, sorry, clinical infection, but remain there. So they remain uh, infected in a way, <laughs> but there is no disease. This is why viral infection is not equal to clinical disease. Okay? So with persistent non-productive naman, when we say non-productive, walang na-produce na progeny virus. So number one, one uh, reason <laughs> as to how this could happen, variant destruction. Okay, The cell um, are so strong that the, um, the virus does have, doesn't have any effect on it and it can block the replication at any point. Or number two, the virus can remain dormant inside the cell, right? There's latent infection. Uh, the, the nucleic acid of the virus can be integrated into the host cell DNA and remain there only to be, um, what do you call this? Only to be triggered okay, by something for it to be, uh, to start replicating, right? Uh, in some cases, uh, the viral nucleic acid can also be in a form of an episome, which is uh, basically it's like a chromosome, but it's not a part of the chromosome. They're just floating there and they could reinsert themselves and they could remove themselves from the DNA nucleic acid of, uh, sorry, from the DNA of the host cell uh, kapag kailangan nila. Alright? And that is actually what is used by some bacteria. And some viruses, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, some bacteriophages, that's what I was thinking of. The last interaction would be the transformation. This is the, uh, the interaction of, this, of the virus in the cell, which causes alterations in the cell morphology 
and that triggers uncontrolled cell division, which is characteristic of cancers uh, or tumors. All right? And this is one way to produce tumors when transplanted to uh, experimental animals when um, they are the mechanism of the virus is uh, replicated in the laboratory setting. Right? So we have oncogenic DNA viruses. They're usually non-productive, meaning they are not uh, we call this producing more progeny virus, but rather they are causing the cells to uh, change. Okay? That is part of their pathology. Adenoviruses would be example, papillomaviruses, herpes viruses. Uh, the polyoma SV40 is the classic example of this and has been replicated multiple times in the laboratory, can cause multiple kinds of cancers in rodents. Um, another example of oncogenic uh, viruses would be the retroviruses, as we may know, uh, feline leukemia virus, FLV, avian sarcoma, leukosis virus, um, HIV is also one, right? So one difference between oncogenic DNA viruses, aside from DNA viruses as non-productive retroviruses are productive, um, DNA viruses carry their own oncogenes while retroviruses would uh, have cell-derived oncogenes, right? I think oncogenes were discussed... Uh, let me know if you don't know what oncogenes are because I did not include this here because I think that was touched either in immuno or in micro, right? But let me know if you don't know what oncogenes are, right? Um, next would be mechanisms of cytocidal infection. Paano nga ba uh, pinapatay ng virus yung cell, right? How does it induce the cell to die or how does it tell the cell to commit suicide or apoptosis right number one inhibition of host cell protein synthesis when the virus inhibits the host cell protein synthesis it also inhibits everything else that comes with it right which includes the cellular mrna for um what do you call this for further translation um production of factors which uh sorry which bind the ribosomes uh, inhibiting the translation these are those ways uh, the ways for it to be inhibited um, viruses can also alter the ionic environment inside which in a way can um, shift the favor from uh, cellular mRNA to viral mRNA and there could also be competition when they produce so much viral mRNA and that will be competing with a cellular mRNA for the translation machinery, right? And that leads to loss of cellular homeostasis. Again, the cell have uh, has these machineries for itself. Once the virus hijacks it, it cannot survive um, that easily and as long um, because it needs those macromolecules. Number two, interference of cell membrane function, okay? Viruses can alter the plasma membrane permeability by increasing it, occurs early in infections by these viruses, and they can affect the ion exchange and membrane potential. Remember, in envelope viruses, they insert their viral glycoproteins into the plasma membrane, and that actually causes the, um, kumbaga, the integrity of this membrane to break. Um, induce synthesis of new intracellular membranes or rearrange old ones. These are just examples of that. All right. And when, uh, remember the, the intracellular trafficking or the railroad na we described natin earlier, if those are changed, the microtubules, the microfilaments, that is actually another cause for the loss of cellular homeostasis. All right. Remember, if if it if this happens to a cell, cell the cell would usually have ways to regenerate or return to its normal balanced act or balanced state. However, if there is continuous inhibition of the protein synthesis, um, inhibition of the host cell RNA uh, synthesis, then wala nang magagawa yung cell kundi just to fold or to lice, right? 
Now, these various cell interactions can cause uh, these uh, cytopathic effects. Right? Um, yung mga, uh, we call this, how the cell dies, basically, uh, can be, can have indications or can have a, a microscopic indications that it is infected. Right? So, what are these examples as seen in this image? Inclusion bodies, syncytia formation or giant cell formation, cell rounding or cloudy swelling. Uh, this one is kind of self-explanatory, right? Cell rounding, there is um, disruption of the cell membrane, so nawawala yung normal comp uh, shape ng cell, and it usually swells, right? That's it. <laughs> Hemadsorption, cytolysis, and apoptosis. Okay, one by one. Inclusion bodies uh, basically are the sites of viral transcription and genome replication in the infected cell, which are quite visible even with light microscopy. So, anong laman nitong uh, inclusion bodies? Since they are sites of viral transcription, they contain aggregates of viral nucleic acid and um, protein aggregates, which are displaced from the nuclear matrix. Okay? Um, in the normal histological staining with hematoxylin and eosin, um, red staining would be protein, okay, the eosinophilic, and a blue staining would be uh, nucleic acid. Right? This would be the chromatin strands. And they can be cytoplasmic or nuclear in location. Okay? Intranuclear uh, inclusions, which is a uh, um, characteristic of herpes viruses and adenoviruses, um, so nasa loob ng nucleus, um, CDV, canine distemper virus, can form both cytoplasmic and nuclear inclusion bodies. However, the nuclear bodies are or kumbaga, special in a way that the nuclear body is made by the host but the inside is full of viral protein okay and uh, sorry and this uh, nuclear body would be in charge of regulating rna processing so another example of cytoplasmic inclusions naman would be pox viruses paramyxoviruses rhabdo and rio right and for rabies okay these um, inclusion bodies have a specific name, which are nigri bodies, right? So this is an example of a herpes virus inclusion body, which stains eosinophilic, right? Remember, ano ang herpes virus? Intranuclear or cytoplasmic? It is intranuclear. As you can see there, inside the nucleus, you have that eosinophilic one that is... Um, the inclusion body. Okay? This uh, picture naman would show those um, brownish. This is actually uh, a Purkinje cell with nigri bodies there for rabies. Alright? Pointed by the black arrows. <laughs> and also, this is another example of that. Alright? The nucleus is right there in the middle. This is the inclusion body, a cytoplasmic inclusion there. Right. What's next? Syncytia formation. Syncytia is a giant uh, multinucleated cell. How do, uh, do, uh, does this happen? Right. Um, remember during the viral replication, uh, the viral surface glycoproteins, specifically the envelope glycoproteins, um, on the that is supposed to be in the viral envelope insert itself on the host cell membrane of the infected cell and that's where the virion will uh, sorry the nucleocapsid will bud from okay these uh, glycoproteins include fusion proteins and I hope you still remember the importance of the fusion proteins okay so when these uh, fusion proteins and other glycoproteins are inserted Okay. They may interact with the surface receptor of the adjacent cell. 
Okay, remember these uh, epithelial cells are, for example, uh, columnar and they are, you know, positioned side by side as seen in this image on the left. Okay, the lower left image. All right. And these glycoproteins, since they are looking for the cell receptors, which are present on the adjacent cell beside them, that could actually activate, uh, sorry, uh, that could actually uh, cause an attachment and will activate the fusion proteins. Now, this will cause um, the formation of fusion bridges, right? Between the two cells, the infected and the non-infected cells. And... Um, for the membranes to fuse and the formation of a syncytium. Now, these bridges, the fusion bridges, will allow the subviral entities, they could be um, cytoplasmic RNA, they, they don't even have to be complete infectious mature variants to infect the other cell. They just need to transfer those raw materials to um, infect the cells and one very good thing about this is that they are doing infection without going out of the cell okay um, wherein they could be vulnerable to the immune mechanisms of the body by um, conducting syncytia formation they could transmit and infect adjacent cells without even getting killed by um, le leukocytes for example right examples um, microscopically again okay these are multinucleated giant cells and hepatitis a virus infected cells you can see right here okay all the nucleus are all inside one big cell this is another example of a paramyx of virus infected alveolar tissue i believe it is uh CDV, uh, canine distemper virus. And as you can see, yung nasa paligid niya yung normal cells and this one is a big, multi-nucleated cell. Right. Hemadsorption. Hemadsorption is the uh, characteristic of some viruses to serve as receptors for ligands of erythrocytes. Okay. Remember the erythrocytes or RBCs, they are also expressing certain protein a ligands on its surface right that is what uh, if you ever wonder why your blood type why we have blood types like a b a b o okay it's because of those proteins that are um, unique to the rbc's that we have in our body and they can attach to certain things now some viruses are capable of attaching to these ligands okay this characteristic is what we call hemadsorption this is different from hemagglutination because hemagglutination is when a virion, a virus particle, can, uh, um, can attach to these erythrocytes. Hemadsorption is when the surface glycoproteins that are being expressed on the cell membrane of the infected cell are uh, attaching to those erythrocytes. I think the picture seen... Um, shown here um, illustrates that perfectly all right so all right uh, now now why is it important why is it uh, why are we talking about it this is actually a diagnostic method uh, number two it also is a research method to detect if um, certain specific uh, surface glycoproteins were expressed in vitro if you wanted to if you wanted a, a group of cells to suddenly um, express glycoproteins after you infected it with a certain virus, this is one way for you to detect that. Now, this uh, problem, sorry, this problem or characteristic, sorry, has uh, they said has no role in disease pathogenesis so far. Pathogenesis so far, however, in some cases, or in uh, what they call this influenza virus, for example, would have hemagglutinin. Um, proteins on its surface which can cause hemagglutination of the RBCs have some role in pathogenesis but hemadsorption by itself they say have no uh, role yet you know for now they haven't discovered it yet
if meron talaga siyang um, if meron mga viruses na kapag nag-infect sa body it can cause hemadsorption they just saw that this is a characteristic shown by viruses um, in the laboratory okay. this is an example of that look at the erythrocytes these are uh, chicken erythrocytes again avian erythrocytes are non-nucleated <laughs> alright so as you can see, they are uh, nagdidikit-dikit sila around those kidney cells. This is also another example of that. Hemadsorption of erythrocytes to um, kidney cells infected with uh, influenza virus. Right? So, on uh, so letter C, you see that um, na, na dumikit the sa mga surface ng cell yung RBC. Right? So, oh, sorry. The blue one would be the kidney cell. The white arrow would point to the erythrocyte. All right. Almost done. Almost done. This is a short lecture. All right. Cytolysis. Cytolysis is basically cell lysis and is preceded by various mechanisms. Okay. Right? Number one, direct virus damage to cytoskeleton, meaning some viruses can actually act on the cytoskeleton and attack its uh itself right enteroviruses for example can induce microtubule damage um certain uh, paramyxoviruses and herpes viruses can depolymerize actin containing microfilaments so that's how they damage the cytoskeleton which is maintaining the cellular integrity um this will induce cell swelling and um one uh, funny thing is a viral surface glycoproteins that are expressed on the surface can actually act as target for immune responses. And as you may know in immuno, um, when uh, these immune cells are attracted or they find out that one cell is infected with variants, they can find a way to cause death to that cell. <laughs> right? Namely, apoptosis. This is the programmed cell death which is activated as a last resort to eliminate the virus factories. Two pathways, I know you remember these clearly. I meant that sarcastically. <laughs> All right, um, so what are the, let, let's make it easy, this is the last slide. All right, extrinsic pathway would be the death receptor pathway, right? The death receptor pathway, you would need um, a certain cytokine which is tnf alpha tumor necrosis alpha to bind to death receptors right there outside the trailer in the fas which will induce uh, apoptosis you know apoptotic pathway or letter b there's another way to activate this uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes can bind to the fas receptor activate the fad which is the fas associated death domain so funny how it sounds and this will trigger the executioner caspase pathway right so i'm not gonna go into detail too much on that um the second one all right the intrinsic pathway or the mitochondrial pathway would be uh what do you call this this is triggered by stress or damage to the cell basically this is the cell telling itself to die all right so it can be any kind of lethal stimuli dna damage oxidative stress, hypoxia, and such. Basically, what these stimuli does, uh, do, oh gosh, my English is bad, would be to activate the BH3-only protein, which in turn would activate the backs and back protein, which will cause a phenomenon called the mitochondrial outer membrane permeability. Right? This will affect that permeability of the mitochondrial membrane, which will cause the leakage of the cytochrome C protein to the, to the cytoplasm, which is, um, what do you call this? Uh, not related. Um, geared or uh, included <laughs> in the formation of the apoptosome which will, in turn, go into the same caspase pathway as the extrinsic one, all right? So these are, this is a general view of the uh, cytopathic effects of a
viral infections pagdating sa mga cells. Of course, when we talk about the different viruses as we go to the different families, I might be pointing out specifics of that uh, virus family. But for now, that is the overview. And I hope that um, we are made clear uh, pagdating sa cytologic effects. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you for listening. And I will see you in our next lecture. Thank you. Have a good day. And as you can see there, ultimately, the viruses that um, infect these uh, cells kill um, these cells. This is what we call the cytopathic um, interaction, all right? And specifically, they can be cytocidal, meaning the cell just died on their own, um, or it can be cytolytic, wherein the cell membrane cannot hold the cell uh, integrity together and just led to its rupture, right? We will discuss the specific cytopathic effects which are uh, visualized through a microscope, um, in the next slides, but let's discuss first non-cytopathic.